Welcome back to the Natty Scene with your host, AJ Morris. I'm back today with another episode with another awesome drug-free athlete. As again, we are giving you an insight into the world of natural bodybuilding. And with plenty of competitions coming up this year, we have got a, uh, a nice platform to be speaking to to other natural athletes. And, and this is really exciting for the world of natural bodybuilding. The first episode got... Uh, really nice response and I think this is something that will hopefully grow in the right direction and we'll get more UK and US athletes on on board and this is going to be a big one today because I know that that Steve has got a huge following himself and we'll be able to reach some awesome, awesome people and reach Steve's followers in today's episode. So Steve, how are you and how is prep going so far? So yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Um, like when I saw you were starting this, I was like, oh, this seems quite similar to like we do revive to stage, which I know you sure. enjoy. Um, but yeah, we're lo- long episodes, so I like the short, punchy kind of yeah, getting right into it. And and it's a yeah, guest think, every week. Yeah. So um, for for things with me are they're good. I mean, I it's almost like some of it's too good like my diet fatigue's incredibly low sure um the physique's looking pretty good um you're always kind of questioning your progress uh and yeah i just did a deload like i said with before we got on air deload and uh got a bit of a cold right now but looking to kind of be i think i'll be five weeks out the end of this week so that's pretty exciting for the the mpa mpa southeast is that correct yeah Awesome. And what category do you think you'll end up in on, on the day? <laughs> if I end up in heavyweights, I will cry with laughter ah. because that would be an absolute joke. I <laughs> should be on the, the upper end of middleweights. Yes, um, squeeze so into I'm, that. Yeah, so I think that's under 78 kilos. Um, do, you, do you imagine you'll have to do any sort of like on the day manipulations with regards to water or your first meals just to make sure that you suck into that bracket? Um, assuming they still let me compete, I'm just going to compete in whatever way in like I come in. So if I'm a heavyweight on the day and they, I, I hopefully they let me compete as a heavyweight on the day yeah. and they won't be like, ah, oh, you've signed up as a middleweight. Oh, no, so they won't, no, they won't do that. It's just obviously your optimal grounds for competing might end up being the middles, but, and, and this is a topic for another discussion, but I remember Harry Ranson competing at the MPA show and yeah. he, di- he dipped into the heavies and actually it ended up being probably a favorable thing for him because the middles were stacked. Yeah, yeah, because I know Gordon and Sam Slack were in the middles and that was like... That yeah, was I mean, MPA if, finals top two. Yeah, it was nuts. Like That class would have been awful. I think the middleweight classes often are... I don't know. I find because a lot of people land there, so they're normally very competitive just because the number of people that are in them by default. That's um, true. Yeah. But for me, and I'm sure like it is for any bodybuilders, like I love to win, but as long as I look better than last time, I'll be happy. So if I end up being in the heavyweights, like I end up being in the heavyweights, and I'll do what I can in that in that division or sure, category. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look your best on the day, I guess, is the yeah. is the goal. So give us a bit of an insight, Steve. When did you start your competition prep this year? I know that it's been a little bit unorthodox and probably some people listening to this will be like, what the hell are you doing? Like, surely that makes no sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when, w- when did you start your prep and what does it look like so far? It's kind of weird. Um, it's I started basically at the end of February, I guess, is when I kind of started prep. But I was already at that point about 15, well, 10 pounds above my actual stage weight and 15 pounds above like my all time low weight back in 2014 when I competed. Yeah. So I expected to be heavier than that anyway. So Mm. I started out lean. Um, So after 10 weeks of dieting, and in fact, it was only about eight weeks of actual dieting because I dropped in weeks at maintenance diet breaks within that, I was already down at 170 pounds. Boom. And looking like I remember talking to you and I was like, you were like, you're going to be ready early if you like c- keep going how you are. Yeah, Because my sure. shows now are in September. So it's like I was going to be ready way too early. So then I took um, and I, I knew this might happen. I took five weeks where I actually massed. So I built calories back up um, and then I maintained for five weeks. And so I've just had the first four and a half weeks of my kind of second half of prep as it were whereas like it's really digging yeah um and so i actually really weirdly kind of the body weight 
and my scale weight has been so strange in that I was 170 pounds kind of at the end of that dieting phase. Yeah. It kind of fluctuated up a bit and then fluctuated back down and I'm still at 170 pounds. Wow. Um, but looking kind of considerably different. Um, and it's actually really interesting because I had a consultation with uh, Broderick Chavez uh, oh, last night, in fact. Okay. And um, I just wanted to hear his thoughts on what was happening with my body weight. And he was basically like, he almost essentially said, chuck away the scale. Like at this huh. point for that kind of level of leanness, it's not really telling you what's going on with your body fat levels. Yeah. And better is like assessments of kind of how you're looking in the mirror, DEXA scans, if you can get hold of them or good caliper testing. He was like, that's going to tell you so much more because at the moment you're, you, you're in that once you're under 10% body fat, that is a tiny amount on the scale, especially if you're only looking to lose like half a pound a week or something. It's like, well, how do you really know? So it's like, you know, looking how you're looking in the mirror, you can be heavier, but looking better. So yeah, it's been a bit confusing and not traditional because my last prep, was so long and drawn out and I, I felt deficit. straight yeah. deficit no diet breaks the entire time so I completely wanted to avoid that so I definitely used a lot of the new things I've learned from Mike Isratel who some of the listeners might know and from Renaissance Periodization they're kind of periodizing their nutrition with their training and really having like segments where I was kind of hitting the diet then backing off, hitting the sure. diet, backing off. Um, and at the moment I mean we'll see how I do and how I look on stage it's worked really well like I couldn't complain like I feel really good right now and I'm to a point at which like I said to you like I feel almost like too good I yeah. feel like I should be dragging my heels six weeks or uh, five weeks out but yeah. I'm not no that's amazing and it, it goes to show guys like the more like and you've talked about it with Pascal so often on Revive to Stage which and obviously the Revive to Stronger podcast is something that I highly recommend that you guys listen to it's the art of planning and it's the art of preparing yourself for this 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 long term deficit with somewhat of a structure it's like we periodize our you know our training we should really periodize our nutrition towards the goal and and you've done that so well that you've essentially made what is a very difficult process as easy as you can potentially make it and mm-hmm. i think you know the more advanced you get as an athlete regardless of the approach whether you start with an awful approach and slowly get to a good one you're going to get better and better at it by fact of trial and error but you've just what and what shines out to me is for you as an individual and as an athlete is that you're just so open to learning and wanting to develop your knowledge so much and a question that I have for you is do you think that you've invested so much in trying to find out the most advantageous way to do this process? Do you think you would have, like, do you think you've done that because you believe that you've got subpar genetic potential? Or do you think even if you did have extremely good genetics, would you still be so invested in the process? That's a really good question because, well, it, it really r- reminds me because I, I literally was just looking back at um, Ultimate Diet 2.0 by Lyle McDonald. Mm. So I was kind of trying to, like you're talking about, like I invest a lot in like learning and this yeah. was me going back to try and learn like his, he has like a segment in there where he depletes and then he kind of then like repletes with glycogen and I was like looking at that, whether that's a good um peak week protocol potentially yeah, so sure in that in that actual book he said if you're reading this you probably have like subpar genetics or like your genetics are average you're not like a genetic freak you haven't got that great ability to build muscle mass and as i was reading i was just so now you've said it, it like it makes right. me think about it um and i know i've actually had discussions with you where i'm like i always talk myself down and i've got a big blocky waist yeah um, i don't like at times I'm like, I'm not that happy with my physique, but as time's gone on, I'm getting more and more happy with it. And I'm thinking, ah, I actually do have maybe some okay genetics here to play with. Um, So I think there's definitely an element of me feeling like if I don't do everything I can possibly, like I'm going to look silly. Um, And there's also elements of just my character is someone who just works their ass off. So yeah. for things like, I'd never been just innately clever, but I got good grades. 
that's because I just revised like a nutter. Um, so I get a bit obsessed with things and like yourself, like I know you look, you listen to lots of different people. You take in so many different resources yeah. and you're willing to change your ways. And I've seen you kind of mold your own little approach as you've gone along. Like you haven't stayed. I think if we look back to the way you were doing things a year ago, it's, oh, it's evolved sure. just like it has for me. Um, and it's exciting. And I think it gets a bit boring if you stay a bit dogmatic, but Certainly, I think anyone who's probably even listening to this podcast, they're probably one of those people that don't have those amazing genetics because the people with amazing genetics just, they don't need, they almost don't need to invest the time and effort. <laughs> yeah. They literally just rock up, take off the clobber and have a huge, awesome physique. And you ask them how they've done it and none of it makes sense. <laughs> and you just so think, just you know, could you be doing something better? which is interesting like it seems to be that you know when you when you do get that perfect match of someone that you know has incredible genetics like if you know if we think of like a brian whitaker or something yeah you know when he's got his training done by zordos and he's having he's having you know lane look at his nutrition and he's he's having all these people taper in and and that's when you produce like world-class results and you get other people that are still like at the world class level and they're potentially not doing things as we would see optimally, mm-hmm. but they're still just superb. And that just, that just shows the genetic factors in bodybuilding that are just so large at the moment. Now, staying on sort of this same feature now, what do you think from 2014, which was obviously your first and your, and your most recent competitive outing, what do you think you've improved on with regards to your physique uh, body parts and and potential areas of your physique that you've brought up and alongside that how do you think that you've been able to do that and achieve mm-hmm. that sort of hypertrophy so yeah great question because i actually know at the start of my contest prep i kind of i was almost concerned that i hadn't improved yeah uh because of part of it was because i'd stayed so close to my stage weight i never let it come back up to i started my 2014 prep at 190 pounds cut down to 160 and I was starting my contest prep at 175 and I only let my weight go up to 180 so I never really got very out of shape so at that point and you see people who and you got quite far away from your stage weight and made terrific gains yeah. yeah you made great gains and like you see these people making great gains so I was a bit like have I made that good improvements but I had yeah so and it was all over, I think, for me. Like, I was, I'd only been training maybe two years seriously when I first did my that show. And I was like, when I started at 190 pounds, like, I looked like I lift. But by the end, and I look back at my, like, some of my physique shots, I'm like, cool. I was like right on the cusp of maybe just too immature to have actually competed. I think I did okay. I think I, I stood my own. But um, yeah, I think overall I just built everything up. I think some of my strong points just became stronger. So my weak points now don't look weak. They just look okay. So like my quads, like I actually have kind of, like, I didn't think I could get a sweep. Whereas now actually just build them bigger. They, they kind of sweep. Yeah. Um, I think my posing's improved, which I think you've talked about before as well, which you'd hope that improves and it does definitely make a difference. But yeah, I think big ones for me that when I look at my physique, I'm like, yeah, overall mass, but quads and then kind of back width and just kind of overall chest and shoulders, that sort of area. Um, arms have always been kind of a strong point. Glutes have always just come in and I've never yeah. had like really Crazy small glutes. glutes. Um, although I have one fat glute and one kind of rip glute. So mm. it's lucky that they only need like a side chest and side tricep from one side so <laughs> I can pick the right side. Um, so I think the thing that made that all possible I think part of it has what's helped is staying leaner, but not so lean that I kind of was unsustainable. I, I think sure. finding kind of a settling point at which you feel healthy and kind of good in yourself to kind of bulk up and within is a good idea. So I was kind of like, I think I got up to maybe just over 180 pounds um, and then came down to like just below 175 pounds. So yeah. I had like a 10 pound range. I was kind of gaining slowly within and cutting within. Um, but I think I actually, and I don't know whether it's slightly just in my head or not, but when I started really progressively overloading volume and focusing on kind of even weekly set increases and like 
doing more volume than I'd ever done in the past, focusing less on strength, focusing less on the weight on the bar, still trying to incre- like incrementally increase it, yeah. but putting less emphasis on kind of powerlifting, more emphasis on bodybuilding, and I really went all in. That's when my physique transformed because uh, there was a point at which I was really struggling with both in yeah. that I was like, I do my heavy work for my power lifts and I was shattered for then my volume work for my bodybuilding lifts. And it's kind of like, well, my bodybuilding lifts then make me tired because of all the volume. So then my strength was highly going up. And I didn't feel like my volume was really progressing. And I was kind of in that spinning wheel zone. So as soon as I was like, right, I'm going to get more specific as like an intermediate going on, hopefully advanced at some point lifter that really helped me out. So yeah, probably an increase in specificity towards bodybuilding. Um, and then yeah, not getting too out of shape, but not kind of needlessly staying too in shape either. Sure. Sure. You know, I think that's something quite prevalent in the, in the natural bodybuilding scene is this idea of people trying to intertwine bodybuilding and powerlifting and maybe getting a little bit, you know, because they invest so much in bodybuilding throughout bodybuilding prep at the end of it, they're sort of like, I need something else. Yeah. And of course, of course, powerlifting can provide that sort of like motivation for, for them to still continue to train and to, con- to continue to have goals. But I do think that that's a limiting factor if the goal is maximum hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. And you do see a lot of people sort of hanging around powerlifting for maybe a little bit too long, doing lots of sort of low volume, high intensity work, taking away from all of the hypertrophy work that they've potentially got in the rest of that session or just skipping it because they're too tired. Yeah. And they don't they don't realistically grow as well as they could do. Um, it's the same with bodybuilders that just sort of like, they get very obsessed with the bodybuilding prep process like I said, at the end of it, they need an, and they need something else, and they go and like do I don't know. They do like some sort of martial art, or they go and do CrossFit, and they go and do this, and they go and do yeah. cycling because they they they're just so bored of bodybuilding. They're not so passionate about it anymore, and then that's it. You know, they 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 have to take a different route. Which I personally have never really struggled with too much. I think you know, at the end of my last prep i did do a bit of sort of powerlifting style mm-hmm. training i did one one meet which i didn't do like any sort of peaking for or anything like that but I, I did feel the need to have a bit of a different goal um so i think you know when when i do reach the end of this one hopefully i'll still be very passionate about my weight training and i'll want to purely focus on just getting as big as possible because i know the goal next time around will be to jump up to a men's open category which will require much more muscle mass so yeah, I think that's interesting. Now, when it comes to your training at the moment, how are you setting things up? Because I know that you have, again, quite a sort of a specific approach to the way that you train. So if, if you could take people through maybe like a general week of training for you at the moment. So yeah, my I think this has been a bit of a game changer for my prep as well. The fact that I'm now self-employed allows me great flexibility in terms of nutritional timing uh, yes. and being able to split up my training how I like sure. and so this has really helped me take control of those aspects and made it just much simpler so I actually train twice a day most days yeah um, my upper body sessions I split into two and one of my lower body sessions I split into two and this is basically following a um, I follow a uh, pull push legs pull push legs split okay um, and so on my upper body days I'm just doing my compounds in the morning uh, I could say in the morning, normally it's like after my first meal, which is normally, I normally train around 12.30 and then in the PM, so they're both in the PM, but I call it AM and PM. Um, later on, about six hours later, I train kind of the isolation work. Okay. So if it was like my pool day, I'd be doing my rows and my pull downs, things like that. And that might take in the first week of my mesocycle, like half an hour, it'd be really crisp, really quick. But the gym's really close, so I can just walk there, gets my steps up, yep. gets me break from work, come back, and then have a couple of meals. So nutrient timing is quite important there. I make sure I even have an intra workout shake, which I know you're a fan of as well. And I actually feel like they've been a game changer for me during this dieting period. Yeah. They make training so much kind of easier. They're a win, like, man. They're such yeah. a win. What are you using it, at the moment, intra? <laughs> I actually use... Gatorade? I use um I go to Lidl and they have their sports they're basically Lucas Aids but they're like one pound twenty for four it's like dirt cheap they taste really good and I don't get any kind of stomach distress from it um so I have that with which is about thirty grams of carbs um with ten grams of whey isolate 
um, just within the bottle, session. Should bottle that up and call it Revive Intro and sell <laughs> it on the site. <laughs> it would do pretty well. You'd make like, more money. It's so <laughs> it's crazy how cheap they are considering like a Lucasade bottle in itself costs like one fifty two pounds. Yeah, it's no, crazy. For sure. But it's just fast acting sugars with a fast acting carbohydrate. Cool. Um, so yeah, that really helps. And then after my workout. Again, it's a lean protein source, try and keep fiber and fat low, getting a bunch of quick acting carbohydrates. So normally I have like rice cakes and egg whites because they're kind of higher volume foods as well. Yeah. And then getting another meal about two to three hours after that and then train about an hour after that. Awesome. Um, and then finish my day with a, a massive salad because that's basically where I get most of my f- vegetables in yeah um and that's good because it that's when i'm normally most kind of hungry and wanting to eat so i can just stuff my face yeah um so that's good and so yeah through the week that's basically how i split training legs is a bit different hit the compounds which is like i don't then my isolations are only abs and calves okay um i don't kind of hit my kind of heavy deadlifts and then do leg curls later because your hamstrings are going to be absolutely like it's just not going to be worth it they're going to be fried by the evening whereas doing kind of like a chest press and then a lateral raise later is a bit different because your your kind of side delts don't get hammered in a in a chest press whereas your hamstrings get hammered through like any hip hinge yeah sure awesome so yeah that's a interesting training setup and i'm sure that people can look into that and you've got you know plenty of blogs on your site with regards to how to set up twice a day training so if any of you guys do want to know more about twice a day training i highly highly recommend that you go to steve's site revivestronger.com and make sure that you check out his recent article on, on twice a day training now one thing that i do want to ask you finally to sort of round things up is with your social media presence at the moment and obviously your your instagram growing you just got shouted out on quite a big page i i think today actually or or quite recently and and you've got some nice growth out of that i can see so at the moment with with that growing and more posts getting engagement and like your, your things getting flooded with questions do you feel more pressure as a physique athlete this time round than you did in 2014? Um, and do you think that it's had any advantage in terms of making sure that you feel accountable to your followers? Or or do you feel like sometimes you feel like it's a negative thing? A really interesting question because I know we actually spoke about this before um, like we even started our competition seasons. Cause we were yes. like, are we going to vlog it or what are we going to do? And I know you are very much like, no, I'm going to try and keep it to myself. I'm not going to vlog it. And you've kind of even yeah. gone down the route of vlogging. Whereas uh-huh. I was, I was like, yeah, I'm the same. Like it's, it's more stress than it's worth. Um, and I tried to vlog in 2014. It was just, I had no energy for it. Whereas this year I probably have the energy, just no time. Yeah. Um, and I was really concerned about the pressure um, and at the start, I was very apprehensive, very worried about it. Um, but as it's gone on, it's actually been quite n- nice in a way. Not that it's kept me on point because I, you're probably very much like me, AJ. Like you, you're never going to go off point. You're always no, going to be right there. And then, yes. um, the I guess the only pressure it's made for me is kind of keeping me opening up about it, talking about it um but no it's it's just been nice actually most people are very supportive um and i feel like i'm gonna have loads of support on the day and i already feel like and i've made posts about this i already feel like i've kind of beat my last year's physique now so i i'm happy with what's happened and um i know i'm gonna step on stage and be happy with that but i can definitely see how it could make it more stressful for people but i don't have like i'm not a pro i don't have any kind of I don't think anyone has any really high expectations of me, which is kind of nice because I don't know, I maybe it's the way I present myself on social media that I don't I'm not incredibly kind of arrogant or like I not talk about the fact I'm gonna win. Yeah. Because yes. I'm just kind of just doing it to, to do better than last time. Absolutely. No, that makes sense. So Steve, thank you very much for your for your time. Now essentially what I want the listeners to be aware of is obviously where they can follow you a little bit further. So uh, just obviously uh, shout out your your Instagram handle and your website and also just let the listeners know exactly what shows you are going to be competing at so that obviously anyone that, that wants to look out for the results or potentially wants to come and support uh, can do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been a, I, I mean, I think we could probably talk for far too long. Good I ramble good, way too much. Nah, um, it's all. been a good chat. Um, so if, yeah, Revive Stronger on any of the platforms, if they just search Revive Stronger, cool. um, I'll pop up. 
and the shows I'm doing are the MPA on the 2nd of September, Southeast, and then the UK DFBA, which AJ is also doing on mm-hmm. the 30th uh, of September, which is Southeast as well, isn't it? So that's in rugby. Yes. Um, and the one on the 2nd is in Tunbridge. So yeah. um, booked my tans and everything for both of them. So yeah, I'm pretty excited. I, I'm so pale right now. It's, <laughs> needs to, I, I can't wait to actually get a tan. Nah, yeah, you'll need about 18 coats. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, thank you very much for listening to, to episode two of The Natty Scene. We will be back later in the week for another episode with another awesome athlete. Uh, Steve, thanks again for your time, and thanks again, guys, for, for listening, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, Steve. Thanks, guys.